How y'all folks doing this fine day? It's Gator here at the Cable Company, and I'm so glad you stopped in to see me today. Today we're going over the Sixth Amendment, and I want to get started right now. Let's get right into it. Um, there's our Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment guarantees criminal defendants nine different rights, including the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury consisting of jurors from the state and district in which the crime was alleged to have been committed. Under the impartial jury requirement, jurors must be unbiased, and the jury must consist of a representative cross-section of the community. The right to a jury applies only to offenses in which the penalty is imprisonment for longer than six months. The Sixth Amendment requires that criminal defendants be given notice of the nature and cause of the accusation against them. The Amendment's Confrontation Clause gives criminals, defendants, the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses, while the Compulsory clause, Process Clause gives criminal defendants the right to call their own witnesses and, in some cases, compel witnesses to testify. The Assistance of Counsel Clause grants criminal defendants the right to be assisted by counsel in the Gideon v. Wainwright, 1963, and subsequent cases. The Supreme Court held that a public defender must be provided to criminal defendants unable to afford an attorney in all trials where the defendant faces the possibility of imprisonment. The Supreme Court has incorporated protected at the state level all Sixth Amendment protections except one, having a jury trial in the same state and district that the crime was committed. Impartial jury. The right to a jury has always depended on the nature of the offense with which the defendant is charged. Petty offenses, those punishable by imprisonment for no more than six months, are not covered by the jury requirement, even where multiple petty offenses are concerned. The total time of imprisonment possibly exceeding six months, the right to a jury trial does not exist. Also in the United States, except for serious offenses, such as murder, minors are usually tried in a juvenile court, which lessens the sentence allowed, but forfeits the right to a jury. Originally, the Supreme Court held that the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial indicated a right to a trial by jury as understood and applied at common law, and includes all the essential elements as they were recognized in this country in England when the Constitution was adopted. Therefore, it was held that federal criminal juries had to be composed of 12 persons and that verdicts had to be unanimous, as was customary in England. When under the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court extended the right to a trial by jury to defendants in the state court, it re-examined some of the standards. It has been held that 12 came to be the number of jurors by historical accident and a jury of six would be sufficient, but anything less would be deprived the defendant of a right to a trial by jury. In Ramos v. Louisiana 2020, the court ruled that the Sixth Amendment mandates unanimity in all federal and state criminal jury trials. Impartiality. The Sixth Amendment requires juries to be impartial. Impartiality has been interpreted as requiring individual jurors to be unbiased at voyeur dire each side may question potential jurors to determine any bias and challenge them in the same is found. The court determines the validity of these challenges for cause. Defendants may not challenge a conviction because a challenge for cause was denied incorrectly if they had the opportunity to use premonitory challenges. In 2017, the Supreme Court ruled that the Sixth Amendment requires the court in a criminal trial to investigate whether the jury's guilty verdict was based on racial bias. For a guilty verdict to be set aside based on racial bias of a juror, the defendant must prove that racial bias was a significant motivating factor in the juror's vote to convict. Venire of juries. Another factor is determining the impartiality of the jury is the nature of the panel, or veneer, from which the jurors are selected. Veneers must represent a fair cross-section of the community. Defendant might establish that the requirement was violated 
by showing that the allegedly excluded group is a distinctive one in the community, that the representation of such a group in veneers is unreasonable and unfair in regard to the number of persons belonging to such a group, and that underrepresentation is caused by a systematic exclusion in the selective process. In 1975, the Supreme Court invalidated a state law that exempted women who had not made a declaration of willingness to serve from the jury service, while not doing the same for men. Since then, the Supreme Court ruled that a criminal defendant has a right to a jury trial not only on the question of guilt or innocence, but also regarding any fact used to increase the defendant's sentence beyond the maximum otherwise allowed by statute or sentencing guides. The court expanded on Emprende and Blakely by ruling that a defendant's right to a jury applies to any fact that would increase a defendant's sentence beyond the minimum otherwise required by statute. Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution required defendants to be tried by juries in the, same, in the state in which the crime was committed. The Sixth Amendment requires the jury to be selected from judicial districts ascertained by statute. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the place where the offense is charged to have occurred determines a trial location. Where multiple districts are alleged to have been locations of the crime, any of them may be chosen for the trial. In cases of offenses not committed in any state, for example, offenses committed at sea, the place of trial may be determined by the Congress. Unlike other Sixth Amendment guarantees, the court has not incorporated the divinity's rights. Notice of accusation. A criminal defendant has the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation against them. Therefore, an indictment must allege all the ingredients of the crime to such a degree of position that it will allow the accused to assert double jeopardy if the same charges are brought up in subsequent prosecution. The Supreme Court held that an incident indictment it is not sufficient to set forth the offense in the words of the statute, unless those words of themselves fully, directly, and especially without any uncertainty or ambiguity set forth all the elements necessary to constitute the offense intended to be punished. Vague wording. Even if taken directly from a statute does not suffice. However, the government is not required to hand over written copies to the, of the indictment free of charge. Okay, now, what that means, well, there was a text right there, okay? Now, let, let's just get more into it right here. We're going to get deeper into it. Okay, now, on the Sixth Amendment, it has the concentration clause. Okay, this is where you can confront your witnesses against you, okay? This is called the confrontation clause right there. Okay, and then the confrontation clause. Confrontation clause relates to the common law rule preventing the admission of hearsay, that is, say, testimony by one witness as the statements and the observations of another person to prove that the statement or observation was true. The rationale was that the defendant had no opportunity to challenge the credibility of the cross examine the person making the statements. Certain exceptions to the hearsay rule have been permitted. For instance, admissions by the defendant are admissible, as are dying nevertheless. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that the hearsay rule is not the same as the confrontational rule clause. Hearsay is admissible under certain circumstances. For example, the Supreme Court ruled that while a defendant's out-of-court statements were admissible in proving the defendant's guilt, they were an inadmissible hearsay against another defendant. Hearsay may, in some circumstances, be admitted, though it is not covered by one of the long-recognized exemptions. For example, prior testimony may sometimes be admitted if the witness is unavailable. However, the Supreme Court increased the scope of the conversation clause by ruling that testimony out of court statements are inadmissible if the accused did not have the opportunity to cross-examine the accuser and that the accuser is unavailable at trial. The court ruled that testimonial refers to any statement in an objective, reasonable person in the declarant's situation would believe likely to be used in court. The court ruled that admitting a lab chemist analysis into evidence without having him testify violated the confrontation clause. 
The court ruled that the primary purpose of a shooting victim's statement as to who shot him and the police's reason for questioning him each had to be objectively determined. If the primary purpose was for dealing with an ongoing emergency, then any such statement was not testimonial. And so the Confrontation Clause would not require the person making the statement to testify in order for that statement to be admitted into evidence. The right to confront and cross-examine witnesses also applies to physical evidence. The prosecution must present physical evidence to the jury, providing the defense ample opportunity to cross-examine its validity and meaning. Prosecution generally may not refer to evidence without first presenting it. The court ruled that the accused had to be given an opportunity to cross-examine a witness called to rebut the accused defense, even if the trial judge rules that defense to be misleading. In the late 20th and 21st century, this clause became an issue in the use of the silent witness rule. Uh, relates to uh, common law rules, okay? Uh, you have a right to you have a right to have them come in. Whoever's making the accusation against you, you have a right to to uh, to challenge that in a court of law, okay? Moving on, compulsory process, okay? Now this is this is good too. This is for you to get your witnesses. You can get your own witnesses, okay? Compulsory process, right there. Compulsory process. The compulsory process clause gives any criminal defendant the right to call witness in his favor. If any such witness is refused to testify, that witness may be compelled to do so by the court and the request of the defendant. However, in some cases, the court may refuse to permit a defense witness to testify. For example, if a defense lawyer fails to notify prosecution of the identity of the witness to gain a tactical advantage, that witness may be precluded from testifying. This is where we go and we get our own, um, we get our own witnesses, and, and we can get them into the into the jury and let the jury see they're the ones that are for you. Okay, that's in the composer. Sorry. Okay, let's move on. Okay, assistance of counsel. Okay, the assistance of counsel. The assistance of counsel. A criminal defendant has the right to be assisted by counsel. In, in the Supreme Court ruled that in a capital case where the defendant is unable to employ counsel and is incapable of adequately of making his own defense because of ignorance, being more mindless, literacy, or the like, it is the duty of the court, whether requested or not, to assign counsel for him. And the Supreme Court ruled that in all federal cases, counsel would have to be appointed for the defendants who were too poor to hire their own. In 1961, the court extended the rule that applied in federal courts to state courts. The counsel had to be provided at no expense to defendants in capital cases when they so requested, even if there was no ignorance, feeble mindedness, literacy, or the like. In 1963, ruled that the counsel must be provided to indigent defendants in all felony cases. Overruling. 1942, in which the court ruled that the state courts had to appoint counsel only when the defendant demonstrated special circumstances requiring the assistance of counsel. Under 1972, counsel must be appointed in any case resulting in the sentence of actual imprisonment. Regarding sentences not immediately leading to imprisonment, the court, 1979, ruled that the counsel did not need to be appointed. But in 2002, the court held that the suspended sentences that may result in incarceration cannot be imposed if the defendant did not have actual counsel at trial. As stated, in 1977, the right to counsel means at least that the person is entitled to help of a lawyer at or after the time that the judicial proceedings have been initiated against him, whether by formal charge, preliminary hearing, indictment, information, or arraignment. Brewer goes on to conclude that once the adversary proceedings have begun against a defendant, he has the right to legal assistance when the government interrogates him, and that when the defendant is arrested, arraigned on an arrest warrant, before a judge and committed by the court to confinement. There can be no doubt that the judicial proceedings have been initiated. Now this is like, okay, now this here right here, this helps where if you don't have any money, you know, a lawyer will be appointed to you. You cannot go into a jury trial if you have uh, any, if you can do time, if you can go to prison without having a lawyer. And it's like, it's like a a person that that, that um you know it's like a pro, pro se the next one we're going to talk about pro se it's like a 
you taking out your own appendix. You don't want to do that. You want to have you want to have the assistance of counsel. Okay, and this is what you got your pro se self representation. Okay, self representation. A criminal defendant may represent himself unless a court deems the defendant to be incompetent to waive the right of to counsel. In 1975, the Supreme Court recognized the defendant's right to pro se representation. However, under 1993, a court that believes the defendant is less than fully competent to represent himself can require that the defendant be assisted by counsel. In the 2000 the Supreme Court ruled the right to pro se representation did not apply to courts. All right, in 2008, the court ruled that a criminal defendant should be simultaneously competent to stand trial but not competent to represent himself. In 1977, the Supreme Court held that the constitutional right of meaningful access to courts can be satisfied by counsel or access to legal materials. Balance had been interpreted by several United States Courts of Appeals to mean that a pro se defendant does not have a constitutional right to access a prison law library to research his defense when access to the courts have been provided through appointed counsel. Uh, this, you can go into... You can go into the court and say, I want to pro se my case, and you can you can uh, be your own lawyer. Okay, that's what that that is, that's a good point to make. Criminal, you know, he can criminal defendant may be represent himself unless the court deems him uh, incompetent. Okay, so I appreciate y'all coming in to see me today. Uh, there's the text too. I'm gonna read the text to you. Uh, there's your Sixth Amendment, uh, United States Constitution. You have you have the uh, you have the, the right to a speedy trial. This is what it's all about. They can't just tie it up and keep it going forever and ever. Uh, they, there's there are so many different rules that they have to follow in order to convict you. Okay, there's the Sixth Amendment. You see my Sixth Amendment. Okay, it's ratified. 12, 15, 17, 91, it expires never. The Bill of Rights. Okay. All right, there we go. Now, these are my little buddies. I'll show you my little buddies here before we go. These are my little buddies. And on on Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we play a little game of Hangman. Right there, you see the Hangman? We play Hangman. All right, and then... This is our, there was one of our words that we did, Mother's Day, and you see he didn't get hung. <laughs> he didn't get hung, and, uh, but that's what we do on Sundays, and I want you to come on back and see me Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Y'all have a great day, okay? Come on back and see me. Bye-bye for now.